It's time for Security Now. Steve's got a ton of news. In fact, a bunch of hacks, including Sega, and yes, even the Twit website. It's all coming up next on Security Now. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Audio bandwidth for security now is provided by the new Winamp for Android, featuring wireless sync and one-click iTunes import. Now with free daily music downloads and full-length CD listening parties. Download it for free at winamp.com slash Android. Video bandwidth for security now is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 306, recorded June 22nd, 2011. Your questions, Steve's answers, number 120. Security Now is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. For a free trial and 30% off your new account for three months, go to Squarespace.com and use the offer code SECURITYNOW6. And by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to Netflix.com slash twit. It's time for Security Now, the show that covers your security and privacy online with our good friend, one of my oldest friends, Steve Gibson. He's not that old, but he's the oldest in several <laughs> senses of the word. <laughs> I've known Steve for a long time. We first met each other uh, uh, when he was doing uh, his early security research on spyware. Actually, it was the click of death, wasn't it, for uh, yeah, for zip yeah. drives way back when on the screen right. savers. The Spinrite 5, I think it was, was the first version which supported anything that you hooked onto your machine, and people were hooking their iOmega zip drives to it and reporting that it fixed this notorious problem. Well, it turns out that it wasn't a, something that Spinrite could fix. It was a, it was a pr um, electromechanical problem with the drive. So I thought, well, okay, they're not going to be having good luck with Spinrite. So I quickly created a piece of freeware called TIP, T-I-P, Trouble in Paradise. Trouble in Paradise. I remember that so well. And that's when I first came up to the studio in South San Francisco, and you and I sat down and, you know, and reminisced. More than uh, 10 years ago. Yeah. And uh, we started doing this show. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, five, almost six years. Well, it, we're in our sixth year now. So yep. didn't waste time getting a show on with you. <laughs> after the TV show went away, we started doing security. I was number now. two after this week you in were, tech that's on right. your Sunday that's show. That's exactly yeah. right. Uh, today we have a, a Q and A episode. That means uh, our hundred twentieth Q and A episode. <laughs> I know, and there is. I mean, this was an insane week. I mean, there's. We we know that we had a major screw up by Dropbox, um, and Bitcoin had all kinds of things happening. Uh, CN CNET has published an amazing spreadsheet of uh, recent attacks and breaches. They've had to, you know, start creating a database of them because there are so many. Wow. Um, and uh, and you had a great story in on GigaOM, which uh, yeah, we could talk about that. That was a was yeah. a very nice story. Yeah, but well, we got updates and news and and attacks and breaches galore. And it, uh, there's so much that I thought, well, I want to squeeze in a couple questions. So I found three that I liked, just you know, quickly, and one. The, the final one is one that we can, that sort of is open for discussion. So we've got a great podcast full of news and, uh, and uh, updates on what's been going on. Well, I love that. It's actually something we started adding to the podcast after about 150 episodes. We said we should really cover also breaches, maybe not even that long, uh, maybe longer ago. Yes, yeah. we should cover breaches and stuff. Before we get to attacks, breaches, security updates, and Steve's amazing Netflix revelation. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I can't wait to hear it. I would like to mention our great friends at Squarespace.com, the secret behind exceptional websites. We've talked about Squarespace many times before. We actually use a Squarespace uh, 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 site for our uh, in-company blog. What is this? It's uh, inside dot twit.tv, the Inside Twit blog. Uh, and we've just been so happy with it. Squarespace is hosting plus software. 
That's important to understand because the software runs on their servers. Their servers are tuned. They're optimized for their software. You don't have to worry about security updates. They do them for you. You're always using the most recent version of the software. And because the servers are tuned for the software, the response time, the responsiveness, the, you just never go down. They've got a great, very sophisticated virtual server technology, which throws bandwidth uh, at your site as soon as you need it, the second you need it. I mean, it just goes on and on. And I, I really would like you to try it. They make it very easy to do so. If you just go to squarespace.com, you'll see a big green button. Try it free. No credit card required. All they want is a site name, a password, and an email address so they can let you know if uh, you know you forget your password or when the site has. Uh, whoops. Let's go to the page here. If the site has, um, uh, you know, the two weeks have expired, so you can decide to buy. So try it free. Two weeks will give you enough time. You have the complete run of the uh, place, so you can use all of those great designer templates. The nice thing about Squarespace, you know, I, I don't think you could say this about most content management systems. That's what this is. Is It's not cookie cutter. Every site looks unique, but you don't have to be a designer to have a unique site. All you have to do is click and push and slide. It, it couldn't be easier. Now, if you do know CSS and JavaScript and all that, you can do the sky's the limit. You can do anything you want. But it really is very straightforward. The design technology behind it is fantastic. I want you to go to squarespace.com. And just take a look at what they have done for SEO, for instance. Look at Kevin Rose's tweet. 85,000 uniques to my site today from Dig. I know this shouldn't shock me, but it does. Insane. Thanks for visiting. Well, Kevin's site is on Squarespace. That's why it works so well. They've got a great anti-spam system, tier one data center, world-class infrastructure. I can go on and on and on, but the best way to do this is to try it. Go to squarespace.com. Click that green button. Now, let me talk about pricing. Remember, this is hosting plus software. Uh, starts uh, at $12 a month. If you subscribe for longer, you know, you do a one or two year deal, you'll get more off. But I'm going to give you an even better deal. If you use our offer code, you'll get 30% off for the first three months. A really good way to try Squarespace at a reduced cost. So you go to squarespace.com, try it free, then sign up for your subscription, monthly, yearly, or two years. And use the offer code SECURITYNOW6. Those first three months will be 30% off. This is a weird uh, offer code. We don't usually use these kind of specialized offer codes, so I'll, I'll say it again. SECURITYNOW, all one word, 6, the number 6. SECURITYNOW6 for, for June, I guess. I think they're going to change these every month. I really want you to try Squarespace. I think you're going to love it. SECURITYNOW6, squarespace.com. The secret behind exceptional websites. All right, Steve Gibson, let's uh, okay. let's get some news, some security news. So, um, the Mozilla gang surprised everybody by releasing Firefox ahead of schedule. Wait, and I just even, installed four. You mean I? I know. And I'm you behind. Know me, I've not yet installed four. Right. Uh, um, I'm at what 3.6.17. I think is the most recent in the 3.6 train and uh, we talked about before that Mozilla is going to be working to move people off of their earlier version 3 Firefoxes although 3.6 is still safe to stay on for a while um, so you know they're deliberately they've made a deliberate effort that is the Mozilla people to to get Firefoxes out more often and one might wonder maybe if they've overachieved in this instance, um, <laughs> overachievers, those darn overachievers. <laughs> there, um, so all. I mean, yeah, feel four just happened. Now we already have five. So you know, a major ahead of the first decimal point release in a very short time. They said they were going to do it by the end of the month, and it went live yesterday from when we're recording this on June on Tuesday, June twenty first. It happened right during our TNT show, I think Tom Tom noticed it said, Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> so five remote code exploits were fixed that were that existed in four. And um, I did have my I have I have an instance of four around so that I'm able to look at it and play with it and see how it behaves and so forth. And um, I noticed it's prompting me to move to five. So it's like, oh, okay. Um, somewhere I saw something random. So I don't, I haven't verified this, but something said that four was not going to be upgraded. What? That is, and I think they were at 4.0.1 is the last thing I saw, but they're just instead going to move everyone to five. Hmm. 
exploits. So five remote code exploits, among them multiple WebGL crashes. And we'll be talking about WebGL in a second here because Microsoft uh, apparently agrees with me uh, in their security feelings about it. Um, I did noted, I did notice that they moved the, the DNT, the do not track option to the top. It's the first entry on the privacy tab, which I congratulate them for. I think that's great. And LastPass does need to be updated. Um, I think it's just that the LastPass client that runs in the in Mozilla sees that you're running on five and says, ah, I'm not sure I'm compatible with that. So what I got a kick out of was that in the in the change list for LastPass for the for the update, it says it'll work with versions five six and seven hmm. of firefox so i think they're just this time they're, <laughs> they're planning they're ahead. ready for the future because so, that might happen next week <laughs> yeah who knows <laughs> wow so uh yeah so uh and when i looked at five it said that the only thing i'm using that was not known to be compatible was I've, i'm running the html validator which i really like it puts a little red x down in the corner of my status bar uh, and it just helps me with my own web page design stuff if there's something that comes up i go whoa what did i you know what, what did i forget and so it's handy to have that and so i know i wouldn't i would and i would want to have it anyway so so i'm on 401 and i just it said uh, applying update so Will it automatically oh. just take me to five now? Is that well? It ought to give you the, Mo Mozilla's policy, and we did we d discussed this a couple of weeks ago. Is they will not push people to a to a to a major virgin ah. update without their knowledge. But they are modifying their policy to be a little more in line with what Chrome is mm. doing, so that they'll they'll like move people along and just sort of you know keep you updated automat more automatically. Right. Um, but but major version updates you do get a say so in, uh, which is a good thing. So and and when I did it, um, oh I, I I know I went under four. Go help about and and when that's you asked, right. I think that's where I saw the update button. Yeah. And when I pressed it, then it popped up a box that said, oh let's go to five. And oh by the way here and I said okay and I said click next and then it said oops here's the one thing you've got installed an add in that is not compatible with with five yet it moved me to five yo so that's interesting welcome to version <laughs> five <laughs> wow you know i wonder are we seeing some inflation because of chrome because chrome you know is at 12 now and i and i i wonder if there's just it's it's version inflation oh, wouldn't that be annoying yeah i mean i hope that's not like, the case but we've seen it happen before yeah, you're right. It does sound familiar. It's like, oh, well, wait, you're on six. You're on version six. You must be ahead of them. It's like, or no, your security so bad that you have to keep counting faster. So. It does say your Flash player is out of date. Never fear, we can help. Oh, speaking of which, Adobe has been driving me absolute <laughs> nuts. Uh, every every machine I turn on, you know. Oh, wait a minute, stop! You know, we got we got updates for Flash, yeah. we got updates for Reader, we got updates for Acrobat, and it's like, oh my goodness! And so you know, and of course, those all require you shut down all your browsers, and often you have to reboot. So I'm sure all of our listeners who are using Adobe stuff still actually, um, I, I'm I'm seriously looking at moving away from Acrobat. I've used Acrobat to create PDFs still. Oh, there's so many better programs, I think. Yeah, I'm gonna go find one because Try, this is just um, my crazy. yeah my favorite's Foxit right now. I use Foxit Phantom. Okay, Foxit, I will go yeah. Yeah, there. Give them a try. They have a free trial. It's you know you have to buy the program, but I like it a lot. I'm sure there our, our chat room will well, have some but, other suggestions. But I mean, I also you know I've I have I bought many instances of Acrobat because right. there it's it's a one use per license, right. and they track them all. And so it's so annoying because you know I'm like I'll, I'll set up a new machine and it's like oh I'm out of Acrobat license, so I got to <laughs> go somewhere else and remove it from something that I'm not really using. You know, in order to free one up and then put it in over here. So it's like, okay, this is, you know, they've lost me finally. Yeah. You know, I, I'm a brand guy, but not, not anymore. It's, it's crazy. Uh, others, others are saying Sumatra. Sumatra. I haven't seen Sumatra, but it's, it's a reader. I, you use, you saying you're using. Oh, no, I want a PDF. You're using I, I, Distiller. I, I, you're using the whole thing. Yep. I'm yeah. using the whole thing. And Distiller pops up and, yeah. and does a great job. In fact, I've got some PDFs from hell that I'll. See if Fox it is able. That's a to, good test, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, just uh, keeping track of 
speaking of updates and upgrades of Windows XP, just to give a support countdown, I would li I'd like to let everyone know, and I'm glad because I'm still sitting in front of XP, we still have 1,020 days left of support of official support from Microsoft on Windows XP. So, but it's no, Service Pack 3 we, only. Yes, Service Pack 3 only. Yeah. Exactly. So some actually this this I was going to ask you this cuz somebody called on the radio show and was reinstalling XP. Presumably, if you install XP early version non-service pack version, they will let you get service pack 3 and then they will continue to support from that point on, right? Oh, absolutely. And that's been their policy. Okay. For example, back when we 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 can check it by looking at Windows 2000. And that's definitely the case. Is okay. You're able to get service pack where do they leave off? 4 or 5 on 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 Windows 2000. Right. So, yeah. All right. Um Okay, so Microsoft, I got a bunch of tweets from, from people following me on Twitter saying, well, Steve, Microsoft agrees with you about WebGL. Uh, on their TechNet blog, they posted a blog titled WebGL Considered Harmful. Uh. And they said, our analysis has led us to conclude that Microsoft's product supporting WebGL would have difficulty passing Microsoft security development lifecycle requirements. Hmm. Some key concerns include browser support for WebGL directly exposes hardware functionality to the web in a way that we consider to be overly permissive. Oh. Browser support. <laughs> That's kind of ironic coming from the creators uh, of ActiveX. No, <laughs> uh, there's a little irony there. Well, we got one. We got. Uh, we'll, we'll be talking about another irony here because they're now running around boasting about how auto run malware has finally been tamed. Yeah. And it's like, oh, I don't know. well, okay, we're getting half of ourselves. Yes. So, secondly, they <laughs> save said it, save it. <laughs> about WebGL. They said browser support for WebGL security servicing responsibility relies too heavily on third parties to secure the web oh, experience. Oh, that's interesting. Meaning that the, the, the graphics device drivers end up, uh, 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 you know, by, by nature of the way this arch the WebGL architecture is, they end up with responsibility that there's no way for Microsoft to police. And finally, they said problematic system denial of service scenarios. So to remind our listeners, the problem with WebGL is that the nature of the way it works is you visit a website which literally downloads graphics rendering code into your system's GPU, into your graphics processing unit, and runs it. And this is native GPO machine language, essentially, um, which, which the, the site provides to your machine when you visit. Well, I mean, this sounds like anyone's horror story. It's not clear that you can break out of the GPU, although that's, of course, the concern. So the, there's a, a denial of service scenario where you could go to a site that just deliberately, you know, puts in an, an infinite loop into your GPU and essentially crashes your entire system. I mean, it's like locks it up and nothing works. And you could imagine some script kitties having fun doing that for a while. It's not clear that it breaks out into, you know, outside of the graphics containment, but this does pass down through the device driver. And Microsoft, to, to, to their credit, is saying, eh, you know, uh, we're going to keep it out of, of IE for a while until we see whether there's any way to implement this in a, in a safer fashion. And there are groups working on being able to offer the benefit without, without this. So this feels like first generation, oh, let's just get it done. You know, go to a website and we're going to download native code into your machines. Like, oh, okay, that's, you know, why would that not raise some suspicion? So it certainly has. Um, there was a bunch of news about a some a new trojan that Symantec was the first to discover. Uh, they found it in the wild last Thursday, called they then they dubbed it infostealer.coinbit, which is uh -oh. the, the words flipped from Bitcoin, uh -oh. and it literally well it 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 gets into your machine and makes a beeline for where your Bitcoin wallet is stored by default. Wallet.dat, right? Uh, exactly. Yeah. If it finds it, 
it sends it sends your wallet to an attacker via a server located in Poland. Now, the you know, and and th this sent shockwaves through the in through the security community. It's like, well, and and a lot of users are like, oh my God, you know, so bitcoins are not safe. Well, okay. You've got something bad in your machine, so that's a problem. But it is, it is absolutely the case, and any bit no, a Bitcoin user has to know this because this is rubbed in your face when you start using Bitcoin. The 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 designer of Bitcoin understood this and made it very clear that the entire security of of your wallet is your responsibility. That is. The, these are this is virtual currency. You, you have nothing to prove your ownership of bitcoins other than this this data that's in your wallet. I mean, it it, it is, is your it is your money. And so if you if your hard just, drive just like crashes, cash would be really yes exactly. Yeah. I mean, if your hard drive crashes, which unfortunately, well, except maybe for. People who sell recovery software. Uh, <laughs> who would that be? <laughs> who would do that? <laughs> if your hard drive crashes and you don't have that file backed up, it's that money is gone. You have there is no way, and they make it very clear, absolutely no way to prove that you ever had that money. So, so first rule is back that file up. You know, I mean, have it somewhere safe. The problem is. If it gets loose, which is a different problem, if it gets loose out of your control, you know, shipped off to Poland, then whoever has that file also has your money. Wow. And and the way the system works, you can't and I mean this is why it's so clever, and we to discuss this in detail in our in our podcast we devoted to how Bitcoin works. The there is no way to duplicate bitcoins. So the first person to to transact those bitcoins renders the the copy of the bitcoins even if it's the original copy it renders them invalid now wallets can be strongly encrypted but that depends upon the strength of the password so everybody listening to this that has any investment in bitcoins if you didn't create a password a strong password for your wallet you absolutely want to do so because the the if you have encrypted your wallet and it's gone off to Poland then the only thing the person can do at the other end is to try to crack the password and we know all about how that works and if it uses weak a weak password it's much more likely to be crackable so encryption so, is not built into Bitcoin though you would use something external oh no no it, it, it it's part of it's part of the client oh, you're okay. able yeah it's able to encrypt the wallet for you and you provide it with with the passphrase that you want to use for that encryption and that you would just, be secure even though they got your wallet dot that exactly okay. that okay. that would be secure because that's that's not part of it's something that you enter in order to un to, to open your wallet so the client can can have access to it so absolutely use a strong password is the is the the first takeaway the second is back up your file because even if somebody else can't get it um if you if you can't either that's a problem <laughs> if you delete it you yeah you threw your money out big money happening in bitcoin land well we had a lot of discussion of bitcoin coming up here because uh they well <laughs> the, the major bitcoin exchange mount gox gox lost their database and actually it's well we'll talk about that in a second but that was a problem. The currency yeah. crashed. Um, so, Microsoft has declared victory over auto-run malware. Um, they, uh, anyone who's interested, can can Google the phrase "auto-run abusing malware." Where are they now? That will get you to Microsoft's TechNet blog link, where they're strutting around and boasting about the fact that. Ever since they turned off and changed their policies about auto run, the auto run abusing malware has been. I mean, the the um, the the degree of abuse has just been collapsing. And that page does have some really interesting graphs that that corroborates that fact. And so I say to that, sheesh. 
I mean, you know. <laughs> I don't they, know. Strong language. <laughs> I know. That's, that's a big word. Got You can put some extra E's in there. Sheesh. <laughs> they finally turn off what all security conscious users have been doing and urging everyone else to do for years. And, you know, this comes back to another one of my favorite phrases uh, is the t that I called the tyranny of the default, which, you know, we saw with the, the firewall and XP. M Microsoft boasts about how XP has a built-in firewall. This was, you know, Balmer strutting around on stage before XP was released. But they had it disabled by default. So nobody had it turned on, and, you know, there were, like, all these remote exploits coming into Windows. It wasn't until Service Pack 2 that they finally turned it on by default. The point is, the key is by default. You know, it's, and it's why, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm upset about third-party cookies being enabled by default. I mean, upset from a, from a tracking standpoint, because most users just leave the settings there. I mean, most users don't change the default. So... So the fact that Auto Run has been traditionally on by default meant that that's what everyone was using. Was Auto Run was on, and you know Stuxnet and other worms and viruses have just been having a ball with that. So finally, Microsoft decides that's not a good idea. They do so reluctantly. I mean, with amazing world-class reluctance, because they don't want to disable a feature in 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 any of their OSs that was ever turned on. Because of the, the uh, they're afraid of the 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 secondary effects that that, that will have. But boy, um, when they do, then they boast about the fact that oh look, auto run is not a problem anymore. Yeah, well, it only took them how long? And I guess Windows has always had it. Hey, a little mea culpa. Uh, I've been talking with our sysadmin Bear, and he says yes, in fact, we were hacked. Uh -huh. So I'm not going to uh, talk about. We've cleaned it. It's safe now. Uh, I don't think that there was an issue, but uh, uh, and I don't. He says he'd prefer that we don't talk about what the hack was until he's got it all locked down. But uh, the, the, if it was it was not an error. There was. And we, we we should tell our listeners of the podcast because this was all. Before was this before the show? Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. People were getting uh, error when they went to uh, our chat room on the web browser on live.twit.tv, and. Um, uh, the error was coming from Chrome. The weird thing is we didn't see it all the time. So only some people saw it. We couldn't figure it out. I asked. Uh, I was I was skeptical. You know, I went to the uh, Google uh, malware database, and we came up clean there. Yeah. But that's just a database. Um, so I'm thinking this was some sort of active monitoring that Chrome must be doing, which I don't know of. I don't know about. Um, and uh, and it wasn't hitting everybody, but that might have been the nature of what was hacked. In any event... Um, uh, it, there was something going on, and uh, and I've talked to Bear. He says, you know, this happens to any public-facing website. We're running a variety of scripts. We keep them up to date, as you know, as uh, you know, pretty assiduously. But you know, there are occasionally flaws, so we've well, got it fixed. You know, on that page is a place where you can enter a username and a password. Could be that. And that's all scary. And unscrubbed. then it takes you, yeah, exactly. And, and it takes you then to an IRC client where you can type things in. And again, you know, we've talked about how this kind of things happens. Any time you are soliciting user input, there's a risk of of malicious input somehow tricking the back end whatever you've got you know back there um and executing that input when it's just meant to be you know benign uh you know username and password so, i didn't realize we also the reason that it wasn't hitting everybody i didn't even know this we have three servers <laughs> i mean i know we have many servers but i didn't know the uh, that it was being load balanced between three servers so uh, you'd only get it one time in three or whatever you know, so. Yep. So the hacker was able to compromise the of database the of one of the servers. Right. right. Was not a database hack. I'll say that much. Okay. But um, I'll, I'll give you more detail. I'm, I'm not covering it up. I just want to make sure everything's cleaned up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, so this is just completely random, but I thought interesting. You and I have talked about this uh, before. Sophos, the security research company, uh, noted that well, actually their their blog posting was pretty funny. They said, please update your antivirus at least once every five years. <laughs> at least. <laughs> Just, you know, for us. Because after seven years, the MyDoom worm 
still exists and is still actively Hard trying to, to spread. And it wouldn't if you had a, a up-to-date antivirus. It is. It is exactly. It is. I mean, because that's got to be so. That's in every AV pattern database that has ever been created since my doom, which was seven years ago. And remember, it spreads by email, and it's a worm. And I mean, everybody knows about it now. Yet there are still machines out there that um, that have it live and running and trying to propagate. And as you and I have said before, these old internet-wide worms will never completely go away. There will always be some machine forgotten in a closet somewhere connected to the internet that will be out scanning IP addresses, trying to plant, you know, uh, my doom or uh, it's basically MS the herpes blast. of the internet. Yeah, <laughs> it's just endemic. Exactly, exactly. So, somebody in the chat room says, "Every five years, who has time for that?" <laughs> I know. It's just such a hassle to have to reboot every five years after you update your, you know, passwords or, or your uh, your patterns. Now, speaking of passwords, um, uh, my friend Simon Zarafa, uh, who finds all kinds of interesting stuff for me uh, and sends them to me via Twitter, found another site. Actually, he was the source of has Sony been hacked this week that we'll be talking about in a second. But meanwhile, we have should I change my password dot com. Um, this is clever. I'm not endorsing it at all because it's also a little frightening, um, but clever. So HTTPS colon slash slash should I change my password dot com. I love it. It is great. It is an aggregation of all of the publicly available... By the way, I think Lieutenant Uhuru is hailing you on <laughs> Channel 4. I... Yeah. <laughs> That's a generic incoming email from my BlackBerry. I like it! <laughs> <laughs> I don't uh, know if everybody I, heard that, but that was great. <laughs> I forgot to put it in the other room. No, that's so. fine. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. That's who it is. Um, so, should I change my password.com? It's an aggregation of all the hacked databases of usernames and passwords, just the passwords that have been made public so far. So this is some guy. He's at D-A-G-R-Z on Twitter. Um, so again, it's at D-A-G-R-Z. And he says, if you have any questions or concerns, please contact me on Twitter at D-A-G-R-Z. Um, on his page, he says, no passwords are stored in the should I change my password.com database. And below, he says, the email you enter will not be stored, transmitted, or otherwise used beyond this check. For what it's worth, Ghostery only reports that he's got Facebook Connect and Google Analytics on the page. And in every way, it appears legit. I mean, my feeling is it is. But he is soliciting that we put our, pat our email address into his website. So if this wasn't a good guy, he's, uh, it's got, he's obviously come up with the world's coolest email address harvesting hack, um, which is probably not doing. I completely mean, again, it looks completely legitimate, and he's got only the best of intent. So what this obviously does is it allows you to put your email address into this website, which will then attempt to look it up in any of the pre of known public previously and recently hacked um, exploits and see whether it's there, meaning that your email address has leaked publicly. So it's a quick way of checking that, which is really cool. Um, a number of less security knee-jerk organizations than ours um, have talked about it. He's got a media link on that page, I think three or four different articles and said, hey, this is the most wonderful thing ever, which, again, I think it's very cool. He's got my email address. Let me put it this way. <laughs> yeah. I did it. And you've not been hacked. Uh, no, not, well. I mean, no, I, I don't I, I think so. I did not put one in. <laughs> yeah. I did not put my oh, in. Oh, I see what you're saying. No, when I did it, it said, no, you hadn't, your email does not show up in this database. Ah, good. Um, but I don't know whether he did anything with my email address. 
but no, and and I'm sure. I mean, I have. You know what? My email address is everywhere. I could. Any. That's good point. It's the Leo address, Leo. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm on every mailing list there is. So (laughs) I can't even imagine the spam. Oh, that's right. You've solved that problem. I don't have it. I've got mail route. Mail route. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I, I just want to bring it to our listeners' attention in case anyone is interested. And maybe the, maybe you've got like throwaway email addresses or scratch ones or something you you care less about. I just you know I can't put mine in there. But you know. let me let me show because we have a a, a a a viewer in studio visiting us uh, today, who just ran it on his uh, on his iPad, and he had been hacked. So ah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna cover up his uh, email address here, and uh, and just show you real quickly. Okay, so that that okay, even you saying that, Leo, the idea that it it actually works, that that for me that tilts the balance. Yeah, I mean, like yeah. over in the yes, I really want to know that. It says your uh, email, username, and password have been compromised at least one time. The most recent recorded occurrence, June nineteenth, twenty eleven. That's <laughs> that's three, three days, days ago. ago. You should change all your passwords as soon as possible. Sure, each passwords. So this means that Lulzsec did it was in that database. Yes. Wow. Okay. It's good you so, ran that. <laughs> well done. Should I change my password.com? Very interesting. Seems I'm going like, to go back there right now. Yeah, it, it, it <laughs> seems worthwhile. Yeah, yeah. Put a few more in. And I do, you know, the guy, it, it's over HTTPS, so he's, he, he, he took the trouble of creating, a, of getting an SSL cert I for that. I think this that, is legit. This has to be legit. Yeah, yeah. I, I do too. But so, again, Greg, thank you for, Greg Taylor's in here with his son, Timothy. Thank you for cool. doing so, that. So I would say recognize the, um, recognize the, the fact that you're putting your email address into a website. On the other hand, you know, we do it all the time whenever we're signing up for anything else. So I think I'm probably being overly cautious, especially when it could provide that kind of a valuable service, like it just did to one of the guests um, sitting in front of you, Leo. There was news of quantum crypto being cracked, and I got a tweet storm. <laughs> After last week, even. <laughs> yeah, I got a tweet storm from this, unfortunately. It has not been cracked. Um, so I just wanted to put everyone's mind at rest. Um, what happened was there, there's this one mode of basically quantum communications, which is believed to be uncrackable, where you use quantum entanglement, essentially, wow. in order to, to lock photons together and detect them in photodiodes. And the idea being that any alteration of the like that occurs during in the light path between the two endpoints would absolutely be detectable because that would break the quantum entanglement. What some researchers did just for the heck of it was they they made the system work differently by by doing a man in the middle attack, but essentially moving the system out of a quantum entangled mode into standard light mode and because the the particular crypto system that had been built as I mean no 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 one's using any of this yet but because the system hadn't been built to detect whether quantum entangled photons were <laughs> being received or just regular happy photons it kept on working and so all the you know the people who didn't look at the fine print said oh my god I mean and, and the headline said quantum crypto cracked well so it hasn't been. And I'm sure the people who set up the entangled photon uh, communications are able to detect now that they've been advised that this is a problem, that they should make sure the regular old non-entangled photons are not used <laughs> instead. So, How can you tell? I think we're okay. <laughs> yeah, the, the entangled ones, they move a little more slowly. Yes, I'm just kidding. That's, that's, not, that's not true. <laughs> okay. So attacks and breaches. Oh, boy. Uh, there have been so many recently. I mean, this is like we've talked about this this section of the podcast expanding without limit that CNET has finally charted them. Um, you can Google the phrase keep up with the hackers chart. And that's probably the easiest way to find this. I'm oh, sorry, keeping keeping up with the hackers chart. If you Google that, you'll you'll find the link to this CNET 
hackers chart. I also tweeted it myself this morning so that I could refer to it in the podcast. So if you do a search of at SGGRC on Twitter, one of my very recent uh, – I think I did two this morning. One of them is, this, is a link to this, which is a Google spreadsheet. And my little SSL monitor popped up when I went to Google, and I thought, whoa, wait a minute. Why is that popping up? It's because Google had uh, recently changed their certificate, and then I hadn't been to spreadsheets.google.com before. So I love the fact that I've got that thing monitoring my SSL connections, and I know many of our listeners do too. And so this um, – this, uh, is just an amazing spreadsheet. It's not even current, and it's still comprehensive and long, but uh, I think it stops on the 16th, so it's a few, like maybe five days back. Um, but anyway, very comprehensive and a little bit unnerving when you look at all of, of what's been going on recently. Uh, what's not, for example, on the spreadsheet yet is that WordPress got hacked. Um, just recently, uh, their blog posting on Tuesday, June 21st, which was yesterday from when we're recording this, was titled Passwords Reset. Um, and they wrote, earlier today, the WordPress team noticed suspicious commits to several popular plugins. Um, they were Add This, WP Touch, and W3 Total Cache. Oh, I used two of the three. That's nice. Okay. Containing cleverly disguised backdoors. We determined the commits were not from their authors. We rolled them back, pushed updates to the plugins, and shut down access to the plugin repository while we looked for anything else unsavory. We're still investigating what happened, but as a prophylactic measure, we've decided to force reset all passwords on WordPress.org to use the forums, track, or commit to a plugin or theme you'll need to reset your password to a new one. Same for bbpress.org and buddypress.org. As a user, make sure you never use the same password for two different services, and we encourage you not to reset your password. What? Not, we encourage you not to reset your password. Oh, to be the same as your old one. So, you know, don't just... Don't be a nitwit, in other words. Before. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Second, if you use add this... WP Touch or W3 Total Cache, and there's a possibility you could have updated in the past day, make sure to visit your updates page and upgrade each to their latest version. So we don't have any more information at this point about what it was that, that happened there, but some, someone got into their plug-in system and, and maliciously, deliberately, altered those three plugins in order to install backdoors in them. So um, we'll have to hope CNET adds that to their list. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Now Bitcoin. Um, this I also got a huge amount of, of uh, tweets from our listeners, which I've if nothing else, I'll use to gauge interest. Of course, Bitcoin is a curiosity. We've talked about it extensively. We did a podcast on it because the technology is cool. It's also interesting sort of just to watch what's going to happen with it over time. Um, like, you know, there's been grumblings in, in the U.S. Congress about legislation to outlaw it or ban it or say that they don't like it. <laughs> don't know what they could do really because it's a distributed peer-to-peer -peer virtual currency but you, you know what the, the both the, what the, the senators were talking about is that what scared them is silk road which is yes. the website that uses bitcoin to sell drugs and drug paraphernalia it's interesting yes. because bit road i tried to go i mean silk road i tried to go to the website you have to be running a tour you have to go through tour to get to bit road to road. be anonymized to get to it interesting. yeah it's really interesting how they've layered it all so here's what we know of what happened. Um, what, what ha I, in summary, the, the currency crashed to $0.1 dollars per Bitcoin. So <laughs> a one penny, cent, a penny, a penny wow. per Bitcoin. And, we'll, and our listeners will remember that it was recently at $30. And since I'm still holding the, 15, the, the 50 
bitcoins that my my computer magically minted for me in less than a week that would have once been fifteen hundred dollars now it's fifty cents and and we did yes well it's re it's it's recovered but oh, okay um, so yes it went from it, for for a while it was fifty cents and we did talk after that about how the currency had I think it dropped to about twenty dollars when we talked last week, and that was due to a flurry of trading from people probably like me who said, "Hey, I'm cashing out now. Thirty bucks sounds like a good deal for a Bitcoin." So, okay, but on June nineteenth at seventeen fifteen thirty six UTC, some person placed one or more orders to sell hundreds of thousands of bitcoins causing its exchange rate now this is through the mount gox exchange um, mount mtgox.org i think it is causing the the their bitcoin exchange rate to crash from at the time it was at seventeen dollars down to zero point one dollars which is one penny Okay, more than one point million dollars was traded during during that one or more transactions, and the exchange was overloaded, so that it took about half an hour to execute the orders. Then, okay, that was at seventeen fifteen, at seventeen fifty one, UTC, Kevin in quotes cuz well, all we have is his first name bought 261,383 if anyone cares 0. 0.763 bitcoins so more than a quarter million 261,000 bitcoins for 0. 0.01 dollars each meaning when at, he caught that collapse at the bottom, and he spent. That's 20, suspicious. Isn't that interesting? Well, he spent twenty six hundred and thirteen dollars to buy up a, more than a quarter million bitcoins, wow. which would have been worth five million dollars back, you know, prior to the collapse. Wow. Now I found Kevin's a, a, a posting from Kevin, which I thought was really interesting, so I wanted to share it. He said, "I'm Kevin. Here's my side." And he, and he wrote this two days ago. He said, I'm Kevin, and I'm the guy who bought 200, and I have a different number here, 259,684 bitcoins for under $3,000 yesterday. I really wanted to keep this as quiet as possible, but I don't feel I can anymore. Here's my side of what happened. On an exchange like MTGOX, there are typically hundreds of standing buy orders where people are offering to buy bitcoins at various amounts and prices. Oh, so he had a a, a sell a buy order in place. Well, no. I mean, this guy, Kevin, is clever. Yeah. So he gives us some background here. When a large sell order comes in, an exchange will start with the highest priced buy order to match up the buyer and seller, then move down to the next lowest buy order. This repeats until the entire quantity of bitcoins being sold have found buyers. Makes sense. Or, and of course that also sets the current exchange rate because you know how far has it come down like you know the most recent transaction was at you know this many bitcoins so that's what a bitcoin is worth now. He says he says so this repeats until the entire quantity of bitcoins being sold have found buyers or there are no more buyers at the minimum price the seller was willing to accept. So the seller can say, I want to sell this many, and I'll, but I'll accept no more, no less than this amount. And so, you know, so our, our listeners understand that. He says, I was watching, like many of you, a gigantic sell order burning through the bids. So this is that, that, that order we talked about before that occurred about 50 minutes before Kevin. Mount Gox doesn't execute trades very quickly, so we were watching this huge order slowly eat up every buy order on the books. 
the price started at around $17.50 and within minutes what had been driven below $10. At this point, I realized this wasn't merely a large seller willing to accept some losses. This was someone attempting to crash the market by selling a huge percentage of the market's total bitcoins all at once. I had around $3,000 US dollars in my Mt. Gox account at the time from earlier sales I'd made. I looked at the market stats and realized that there were tons of orders to buy bitcoins at one cent, that is 0 0.01, that would likely eat up any remaining bitcoins this seller had on order. I figured if I put a buy order in, and I love this, for 0 0.01, Zero one zero one. So he puts his buy order in for one hundredth of a cent over a cent. Smart. Yes, very smart. He, I mean, he doesn't know that he's going to get anything, but it, why not? You don't have any why? risk. Exactly. And, look, and he's able to buy bitcoins at a penny, right. essentially. He says, my order would execute. There's a her again. My order <laughs> would execute first. And I could buy a huge amount of bitcoins uh -huh. from this seller before it hit the bottom. Smart man. Isn't that cool? The only problem was that Mt. Gox was running slower than molasses at the time. And everyone was saying that it wasn't accepting trades. I had to try several times, but eventually I got my buy order in, offering to buy as many bitcoins as I could for 0 0.0101. The site stopped responding completely for a while, probably from so many people hitting refresh to see what was going on. When I got back in, I saw my account. And he, he posts 6.19.11 at 17.51. Bought bitcoins, 259,684. <laughs> Point seven seven <laughs> for zero point zero one zero one. He must have. He must have gone. Hope. <laughs> oh, uh, he, he says Hope. I had just purchased over two hundred and fifty thousand bitcoins for twenty six hundred and thirteen dollars. Good deal. At the trading price immediately before this large sell order happened, that number would have been worth nearly five million dollars. Wow. After I regained my breath, because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I mean, you know, he, he obviously he's active in bitcoins. He's he he had you know some low number probably historically. Suddenly he has got a quarter million of them, and he knows what they used to be worth. Right. So he says, after I regained my breath, I tried to figure out what to do. I wasn't sure what was really going on. Over the past few days, there had been a lot of talk and complaints about Ma Mt. Gox's security. Lists of Mt. Gox usernames, email addresses, and encrypted passwords were being traded around, which was an obvious sign that security at Mt. Gox had been breached in some way. If there was an attacker in the system, perhaps he was able to log into my account now and force my account to execute some other crazy trade. I attempted to withdraw the Bitcoin balance into my own wallet. So I essentially moved those Bitcoins, which, which Mt. Gox had, had converted from dollars into Bitcoins, but they were still holding. So he wanted to transfer them into, you know, into his own machine, essentially, into his own wallet. Um, and he said, and hit the, but he hit the limit that Mt. Gox has, preventing you from withdrawing more than a thousand US dollars worth of bitcoins um, at the current market value in a day. So I remember that he now had about $2,600 worth at the super low driven down to a penny price. This transferred 643.27 bitcoins to my personal bitcoin account. And I think he, he meant to write dollars worth of bitcoins to my personal bitcoin account before hitting that limit. 
It was pretty well known that the limit for transferring bitcoins was actually broken in Mt. Gox. It stopped you from moving more than that in one withdrawal, but you could immediately ask for more and get another thousand U.S. dollars worth over and over. I decided so they weren't doing their a, a day check essentially. I decided against this since it was exploiting a bug, and I definitely didn't want to do anything suspicious looking or improper. Anyway, that's all I wanted to share. Well, I His, think that's a fair defense. Don't you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely. And it makes do. sense. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, there is a fabulous graphic of the collapse, which is a at a site called leanback.eu and you can look at it leo because i the, the the link is in our notes um pulling which it is up right now very cool looking maybe you can stick it up on the video feed for um uh, pe people who have the video yes um the what we do know is mount gox has confirmed that their entire account database was exfiltrated and posted publicly they wrote it appears that someone who performs audits on our system and had read-only access to our database had their computer compromised. Oh, this, interesting. This, yes, so it wasn't actually the Mt. Gox system, although there are credible, credible security analyses of their website that has demonstrated some serious security problems too so it's not like they're in the clear here um, what so so I said this allowed someone who got into their auditors system with read-only access to pull the user account database um, that consists of username email addresses and password hashes so they were hashing unfortunately they weren't hashing very well um, 61,016 accounts were in the database. Most were hashed with a Unix MD5 base crypt, which is pretty good, but 1,765 were plain MD5 unsalted, non-iterated hashes. So brain dead, basically. They're going to be in any rainbow table, um, you know, because MD5 has been well rainbowed already. Um, and in fact, so the those hashes if you if people do google search for the hashes they're turning up on the net and they've been cracked so accounts have definitely uh been troubled um so later in a blog mount gox said we're happy to report that over 10 percent of our user base have already reclaimed their accounts um and so they must have done an account lock and required people to change their passwords um, so they said newly rec reclaimed accounts require strong passwords, which are now secured with an SHA-512, so that's secure hash algorithm, 512-bit, multi-iteration, triple-salted hashing. Yum. Now, I don't know what triple-salting is, but it sounds like it's bad, bad for your blood pressure. <laughs> it does. Um, so it's their triple-salted, multi-iterated uh, hashing so they've certainly increased their security over what they had before um, now what they're doing is they are rolling back all trades which occurred from that that first collapse which was a fraudulent trade apparently perpetrated by somebody that was able to get all those bitcoins as a consequence of having compromised accounts or maybe stealing them because there's something else that happened um, recently uh, we'll talk about in a second um, so they're going to roll the basically they're invalidating all trades and, ro and uh, resetting time to before this occurred and putting the exchange rate back to where it was at seventeen dollars and fifty cents um, so so that's the story that many people of our many of our listeners had asked about like you know what what exactly is it that happened um, also in the news was the fact that some sad user on June 16th had his computer hacked, not through any particular means. We don't know exactly what it was that he got into his machine, but he at the time had 25,000 bitcoins worth half a million dollars, and they were stolen. So he says... 
So he says. Can we validate? I mean, is there a way to know that? Well, remember, I mean, one of the cool things about the whole system is that it is absolutely anonymous. You know, so he says he had those. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, we know how many Bitcoins exist, and there is an absolute audit. Uh, part mm -hmm. of the technology is you have a log of every single transaction that occurs. So... Um, Anyway, um, I remember him he, him being credible. He's been in the community for a long time. Uh, you won't believe what his handle is. His handle is all in vain, if you can believe it or not. <laughs> so he was depressed already. <laughs> and, and, and it's believed that because he's been a, involved for so long that uh, he was probably an early miner, and he was mining bitcoins and, you know, using GPUs and, oh, you know. Come on, though. How could you get and, that many? Uh, yeah, and why would you not uh, trade him out? Uh, well, probably he was, he, he, was, he was reasonably expecting, based on history, that you know the value was high and going up. And so mm -hmm. he was thinking, yay, I got 25,000 bitcoins. I'm going to hold on to them. Yeah. So, yeah, he's not happy right now. Um, and finally, the EFF has stopped accepting bitcoins as donations. Oh, that's um, a surprise. Well, they and, and they, they, they have a nice blog post where they explain it, and they said, they gave three reasons. They said, we don't fully understand the complex legal issues involved with creating a new currency system. Um, and then they, and that's the, sort of the, the headline of a paragraph where they go into like, you know, the Congress is not happy. Um, we're not sure where this stands in terms of like legal structures and statutes and so forth. I mean, you know, so they recognize that uh, currency really brings with it much more than the cool technology, which is all we talk about and, and right, really right. focus on here. You know, it's really a, a, a big deal. Um, but they're just saying we don't understand them, so we're going to say, oops, no. They also said, we don't want to mislead our donors um, about, like, where they stand. I send and them American they, dollar. And I, they said I, people... That's a good, a good courtesy. Yes, and they said people were misconstruing our acceptance of Bitcoins as an endorsement of Bitcoin itself. And I think that Absolutely. was... Absolutely. Yes. The fact that the EFF was taking them at Bitcoins as donations said, hey, you know... You know, somebody very reputable, and certainly the EFF is, is accepting them. So that gave them some some credibility. They they said that they're going to take all the bitcoins that they have accrued, and dump them into the Bitcoin faucet, so that they are back in circulation, and they feel like you know they're sort of they're sort of washed their hands of them. So, um, anyway, uh, that's the story on Bitcoin. Hmm. But it's not the story on attacks and breaches for the week. No. <laughs> Far from it. Last Sunday, are you sitting down, Leo? You, you probably are. You are I'm on, ball, on my ball. I guess it's I'm sitting down. I, I, I'm, for, four, I'm for, four, for four hours last Sunday. Uh, I know what you're going to say because I already, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I already fell friends, off my ball. Off our friends <laughs> at Dropbox had a minor little software update glitch, Oops. which meant that no one's password was being checked, and anyone could log in to anyone's account with no password or any password. Um, the Dropbox blogged, um, and this was uh, 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 Arash Ferdowsi, he blogged on June 20th, so two days ago. He said about yesterday's authentication bug. Hi, Dropboxers. Yesterday we made a couple. We made a code update at 1:40 at 1:54 p.m. Pacific time that introduced a bug affecting our authentication mechanism. We discovered this at 5:41 p.m., so a little less, a few minutes less than four hours, and the fix was live at 546. A very small number of users, much less than 1%, logged in to Dropbox during that period, some of whom could have logged into an account without the correct password. As a precaution, we ended all logged in sessions. 
we're conducting a thorough investigation of related activity to understand whether any accounts were improperly accessed. If we identify any specific instances of unusual activity, we immediately notify the account owner. If you're concerned about any activity that has occurred in your account, you can contact us at support at dropbox.com. This should never have happened. We're scrutinizing our controls and we will be implementing additional safeguards to prevent this from happening again, signed Arash. Now, um, I don't think there could be any better example of, of why we absolutely have to adopt a PI, the PI in the sky, PIE, pre-internet encryption. If anyone was doing that, if the only things they had stored were strongly encrypted things, then then the worst an attacker could have done would have been, you know, there would have been no loss of information. They would have gotten files of pseudo-random noise. Um, they could delete them, but I think Dropbox uh, has an undelete mechanism. So, thing, or they could have modified them. That would have been annoying um, if you if you didn't have backup copies of the original of, of the original files. So, certainly, it's bad for people to get into your Dropbox account. But this it certainly says you absolutely want to be encrypting this. So I wanted to bring two things to our listeners' attention. There is an event log as part of Dropbox, and you can just get to it with dropbox.com slash events. And it will show you pretty much with nice granularity everything that has happened to your Dropbox account um, in recent time. And you can, move, you can choose 10 or 25 entries per page and move back in time. And so if anyone's concerned and is a Dropbox user and may not have been using it during that period, that is to say from 1.54 p.m. Pacific time on Sunday to, and that's be the, the 19th, uh, for four hours after that, you can just check the log to see if anything happened on your account. Or, or if you were using it, if anything looks like it wasn't you on your account. And there is an interesting, an interesting client-side encryption, you know, a Pi solution, pre-internet encryption for Dropbox called Secret Sync. It's getsecretsync.com slash SS. And I have looked at them before, and I looked at them again this morning before I uh, put this entry in my notes, um, and I like what I see. They create their own encrypted folder, and they say, put the things that you want to encrypt securely for Dropbox into the secret sync folder, and it will encrypt them before Dropbox has access to them. I like that. Yes. It looks clean. It looks legit. Um, there's a link in the upper right of their page to the parent company, which um, offers this also for Box.net and has a number of other encryption solutions. So uh, it looks good and real. And I don't know why. And they say, you know, put things you don't care about the security of in, in Dropbox, uh, in the regular Dropbox folder, put the things you do care about in your secret sync folder, and I don't know why you would put anything in the non-secret sync folder. But so anyone using oh, there's, Dropbox, you, there is public. You can use Dropbox for public files. You obviously ah, want to okay, encrypt sure, those. Yes. Yeah, this is great. Yes, getsecretsync.com/ss. Now, do we know that they don't know our <laughs> our passwords? Um, I, I I have not fully vetted them. I haven't. I, you know, they're they the the thing I was able to do with LastPass was a little bit unique because of the nature of of who LastPass is and and you know just how forthcoming they were with their technology. Right. You know, showing things like you know here's our scripts, here's a page where you can demonstrate that the same thing. We're, we're we're doing in our script is what is what we're saying we're doing. I mean, it was I was able to really thoroughly examine it, um, but I have no reason to mistrust these people. They do and, say it's client side uh, encryption, which is what we're looking for. That's exactly what we want. We want client side encryption, so it's it's done in your browser. And they use AES two fifty six encryption, so anything is encrypted before it goes out of your machine, which is exactly what we want. Um, and let's see, Sega Pass was breached and lost 1.3 million account uh, users. 1.3 million. They said over the past 24 hours, 
we have identified that unauthorized entry was gained to our Sega Pass database. The breach resulted in the compromise of email addresses, dates of birth, and encrypted passwords of 1.3 million users. But luckily, no personal payment information was acquired by the attackers since Sega doesn't store it and uses external payment providers. So, you know, this isn't super bad, but it's email addresses. Um, and it does, they do say that the passwords were encrypted, but they don't give any details. Like, was it just an unsalted, you know, single iteration hash or what? We don't know. But uh, so that makes it to the list. And I checked back in with, has Sony been hacked this week? And we still get a big yes on the page. And we're up I to mean, really big. <laughs> yes. And we're up to 20 times in two months. Oh, man. They've added a Sony hack history page just to run through. And in fact, the top entry on it right now is suggesting maybe it's time for people to stop using Sony. Oh my yeah. goodness! Because that just it's just goes on. I mean, then you know it's it's sort of you sort of start glazing over. But I mean, these are all real, legitimate, true hacks. Now I'm uh, a little you know, now that we're in the club, <clears throat> so to speak. I'm a I'm a little less anxious to knock anybody for being hacked. But holy cow! Yeah. <laughs> holy cow! Yeah. Now finally, there was a non-hack that generated a lot of news and for me a lot of incoming tweets there was the there was the claim that the lulz security folks lulz sec had hacked the uk census that they there was a posting on i think it was on pastebin that said that the that the entire uk census database had been acquired by lulz security now, it turns out that's not the case. Um, uh, Low security doesn't normally announce in paste bin, so that raised some suspicions, and they formally stated that they did not hack the UK. But if, uh, if anyone was interested in asking for them help, their help, they would be happy to, in their words, destroy the people who did hack the UK, if anyone did. And in fact, there's no evidence. The, 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 the pastebin file said, you know, we're currently looking at the database and we'll be posting it, uh, you know, in the future. So no, no evidence of this other than a spoof. And it's just believed to be a completely fraudulent spoof. Huh. Nothing behind it. I can add uh, one more. It's not a hack either, but it's an interesting story. You know I use Pinboard uh, yes. as, instead of Delicious, because Delicious, I don't know, Yahoo gave them up on them for a while and then they sold it to somebody and you know I just don't know what the future of delicious is and I love pinboard pinboards written by one of the delicious founders it uses the delicious api it's a bookmarking system i use for all the shows so the fbi uh, takes some servers down mm. Did you see this story? I, I did, but I, it didn't make it onto my list. Go ahead, Leo. Well, let me add it to your list, only because yeah. I'm kind of interested in, in what's going on with Pinboard, and we still don't know. But Pinboard was down uh, for quite some time uh, earlier this week, and it had been so reliable, and they had such a good business model, you know, and I just thought, well, this is going to be, these guys are going to be rock solid. Um, apparently, the, uh, the FBI, in an attempt to uh, go after... One particular uh, site. One site, a customer yep. of a, uh, a, a hosting company called Digital One. Um, they apparently couldn't figure out which server that they wanted, so they uh. took out three racks of equipment, including, apparently, the Pinboard server. They just took it. Uh, Pinboard's running on a backup server. They don't know if theirs was lifted by the FBI, but they just know that their server, their database server is gone. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> Disappeared. Um, uh, they, they just, and, and because Digital One is locked out of the server farm, they can't, they don't know. Wow. Um, in fact, it doesn't, the New York Times reporting this story doesn't even say, it does say they don't even know which of their data centers I mean, it's this. This is so ham-handed. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it curbed network, a New York publisher, offline, not because they're suspected, uh, but because they were in those racks and they were in the same rack. Yeah. Wow. 
Um, so I just, uh, apparently this is part of the Lulz SEC investigation, but, and you know, I'm not anti FBI. I have a lot of friends in security uh, services and, um, uh, I know that these guys are actually pretty smart, but that's just ham handed. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if, if you're pinboard, well, it, you gotta... it's more than that, Leo. I mean, it really does. It, it evidences an, an absolute lack of caring. I mean, that was deliberate. It's one thing for there to be a mistake made, like, for example, where a top-level domain, or rather a second-level domain, gets taken down, as we reported months ago, um, in order to take a site off. And it turns out that that was a web hosting domain with many other domains right. underneath it's it. It's happened that's, before. That, that was ICE, mis- right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a mistake. This was deliberate. This was people at the FBI who said, well, we don't care. We're taking them all. Or they were ignorant. They apparently thought that one enclosure equals one server. So they just took the whole enclosure. I don't know. You'd have to be so... stupid. You'd have to be the janitor, Leo. I mean, if you've seen a rack of servers, there's no way... I mean, it looks like... There's a bunch of machines. It it looks like, you know, like the computer from the old Seaview back on Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. I mean, it's, you know, it is... You can't think that's one of anything. It looks like it could run the entire world. The so. uh, Instapaper, which is another service I use, had a server there. It's gone. Uh, Marco Ar- Armet, who runs Instapaper. Instapaper? No kidding. Yeah. He oh. said, now fortunately he has other servers, but he said uh, we our site is up but slowed by this. Unbelievable. And, and Armet uh, says he hasn't heard from Digital One or law enforcement. Yeah, I, I don't give them a pass on this one. I give them a pass on making a mistake, and they need to like like ha- has had had happened before. But this, this was, I mean, it wasn't malicious, obviously, but it was deliberate. They had to know. Anyone has to know. I mean, rack three racks. The the servers are probably little one U slices. So you're gonna have, you're gonna have hundreds of these little one U things all blinking and spinning. I mean, it's going to be incredibly heavy, use an amazing amount of power, but I mean, it's obviously going to be much more than what they were looking for. Oh, It's not unusual for law enforcement uh, when they're doing a raid. Uh, you know, if they're raiding, for instance, a house, just take everything. They, they do take everything. Just take everything yeah. because you don't know what's going to be evidence, what's not going to be evidence. Yeah. Uh, but there's such big collateral damage to completely innocent sites. Wow. Uh, Yeah, I mean, it can't be allowed to happen in the future. I mean, the world and commerce and the economy is coming to depend on this this crazy toy that DARPA invented to pass packets around, that which you know we now call the internet. It's I mean, it's it's becoming really real, and so you just can't arbitrarily say, "Well, we're going to just you know take away a chunk of it." Ah, anyway, I just. I'll be very curious to see if we hear any more or if there's any – nobody's saying anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a bit of a rata because I wanted to note that um, Java applets, I had said that they, rec- they could only be invoked through JavaScript, which is not the case. So I wanted to correct that. Even with JavaScript disabled or not using JavaScript, there are native means in HTML for embedding using the embed tag um, a Java applet in a page. So I wanted to correct that. Um, NoScript does control Java applets in addition to JavaScript. And so, for example, if you go to a page that that even has JavaScript disabled, you can click on the Java applet and say, yes, I want to just run this one Java applet. Um, NoScript gives you that control. So I wanted to correct that. And I had uh, a couple quick notes from the Twitterverse. Uh, Robin Morley tweeted uh, his experience with Ghostry. He said, is a 25 score on Ghostry a new record? Courtesy of Salon.com. That's the it's largest like, I've seen. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Can you imagine twenty-five <laughs> spyware tracking things? Well, and I, you know, that's the kind of thing you'd expect on Salon.com. I mean, where they're they're being hosted and uh, by virtue of all the advertisers and so forth. Um, uh, what do I have here? I have um, oh, um, um, Mark Beaupre. Uh, in Montreal, Quebec, said uh, one way to know whether the site stores your password in clear text is whether they send the password itself 
when you perform account recovery. Oh, and that's true. I thought that's that was a right. very nice point. You know, they if they hash it, they cannot possibly send you your password in clear text. So if anyone ever does, you know that they're not hashing it. So, I mean, it's probably obvious in retrospect, but I wanted to just make note of it. And uh, several people have talked about positives, surprising positives, from Microsoft's System Sweeper. Um, and one, Rick Staples, um, tweeted me, and he said, Thanks for the tip on the Microsoft System Sweeper. First test subject was positive. And I've decided that I'm going to deliberately run it on all my machines. I don't believe that any of them have any malware in them, but that's the point, is many people are reporting that, that System Sweeper is finding rootkits that they had no awareness of. And so if you don't run it, you don't know. And I've decided, well, you know, uh, when I reboot my systems, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reboot um, off of a, a freshly made ISO and just make sure that there's nothing there. So I wanted to encourage listeners who, for whatever reason, you know, may may have um, you know gone to unsavory places, may have had something their machine acting up, but then now they think it's okay. Maybe they found some stuff and and they believe it's removed. Anyway, if there's any reason to think that something might not be right, not be com not be completely copacetic. Uh, I would recommend Microsoft System Sweeper. Um, I'm going to do it on all of mine. It does take uh, a while to do, Monkey Sticker it, points out. Yes, it does, yes. Um, and uh, Lawrence Goode, G-U-D-E, sent a nice story from Western Australia in Perth. He said, here's a spin right story for Steve. I have a neighbor who has mild Alzheimer's who's also been forced to give up his flat and move into a nursing home about 20 miles away on the other side of the city. His compact notebook computer has become his main way of keeping in contact with his family and friends. He's a bit of a noob, and he often manages to get it pretty tangled up. I fix it for him when I visit him on Thursday afternoons on my way to Tai Chi. Um, it is his lifeline. So he works hard to learn new things and has progressed from email to Skype to Google Earth. Last month, just a couple of days before leaving for the U.S., I paid my friend a last visit, and the inevitable disaster had occurred. The compact would not boot. Spinrite immediately came to mind, and I knew that it would be complicated and expensive for him to have the computer fixed commercially. But I didn't have much time. My problem was getting it back to him before I had to fly out. Quick as a flash, my friend saw the solution. I could leave it in his old flat, which was near me, to which we both have keys, and he could retrieve it after I flew out using his electric scooter and a Perth's excellent train system, which can accommodate scooters during non-peak periods, just FYI. In the end, that was not necessary. When I got the compact home, I immediately ran level two, and it finished in less than an hour, and booted up first time. No time-consuming need to reinstall Windows and all those endless updates. To be safe, I ran Spinrite again on level four overnight, and was able to drop the computer off the next day in plenty of time to catch my flight. I know it's still working, because I get emails from him regularly. Now, Steve... All we need is spin right for the human brain. I hereby volunteer for a level four scan anytime you're ready. So that was a neat note. Thanks very much, Lawrence. <laughs> awesome. Let me just uh, check before we get to, we do have a few questions. Um, let me just check to see. Yeah, we're still, uh, Barry's still cleaning up uh, the uh, aftermath of the hack. Just to say it again, um, I guess it was our chat software there was a library on the server that was hacked we don't we're working on to figure out how that happened it was only one of the three servers it did not propagate to other servers and as far as i know i don't think any information uh i know there's no information in there except for perhaps a chat password um we'll let you know if those were compromised uh, i think that's a pretty low security issue but uh, we'll certainly let you know as soon as we find out but we want to keep it on the qt for a little bit to make sure that all the holes are patched before we we'll talk about next week yeah, or maybe sooner. I'm, yeah, it looks like um, it was a file insertion attack. So 
um, we're working on. We've got everything. I think we've got everything repaired. We just want to make sure we don't, that the hole is plugged before we right. talk any more about it. And we got some good sysadmins, and I have absolute confidence in these guys and their ability to lock stuff down. So it just shows you, uh, even with a very well-run system uh, and some very uh, aggressive um, sysadmins, things, things, stuff well, happens. Okay, so Leo, I looked at the page, and it's a ton of JavaScript. Yeah. And this is not JavaScript that you guys wrote. This was JavaScript that other people wrote with the best of intentions. But it's, I mean, that's the problem, is that, that you know, code is, is incredibly complex and difficult to write with, you know, even with security in mind, there are, there are things that can happen. And, we, and, for example, you know, Dropbox made a mistake where they used to have, you know, password checking and that somehow got disabled for four hours. So, so stuff happens. So, I mean, it's, the, the, the problem is that, that you know, that you guys, I mean, this is the only practical thing for you to do, are, are using scripts from someone else, which, you know, to provide well, IRC stuff. Uh, and I'll, I can give you a little information. The, 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 um, there was a, a f we use a very well-known library that is absolutely a great library. That library was modified. What we don't know is how it was modified. So it's not that we use something that inherently was dangerous, but that something was modified. The point you're making, which is absolutely true, is there's a lot of stuff on that running on that server. And we don't know exactly how the bad guy got in. Right. So um, we're working on that. And once we know that, we will let you know. And we'll also let you know what kind of a compromise. It's, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not like we're doing e-commerce here. <laughs> we don't so, know much about you. Leo? Yes. I did it. I did it. What? I'm now a Netflix user. Yes! Now, what was it I, that put you over the top? Well, it was $8 a month. I know. Why I, not? I thought, that's, that's nothing. That's I less mean, than I, your VOD for a movie and a half. And, and I think I didn't really get it until I was using HBO Go. And yeah. I realized how very cool it was to just be able to surf through HBO's database and watch whatever I liked. I mean, I'm yeah. I'm totally addicted to Game of Thrones. Oh, me too. And, I've missed. Uh, don't tell me anything. I haven't seen the last episode yet. Oh, Leo, the last three minutes. Now, the last three minutes. Of I read the book, episode. so so I I know what's supposed to happen. But <laughs> oh, well, they they do a great job. Uh, so, it's been a very very enjoyable series. I have to say. Yeah, I'm really liking it. And anyway, so I thought, okay. You're so you're telling me that for eight dollars a month, I could have the same experience on my iPad with all the movies there are. Right. It's like okay, how hard is that? I mean, that's just obvious. Yeah, I it. love HBO Go, but you have to be an HBO subscriber, and your cable company has to allow you to do it. Not all cable companies do. Right. Um, they, because because the cable company is the in the authentication loop right. for. At giving HBO permission to, or uh, exactly. validating HBO that you are a subscriber. Yes. Exactly. But uh, but the night now I, I should say it's not every movie there is on Netflix, but uh, it's a very nice selection of movies and TV shows. And uh, for seven ninety nine a month, you can watch all you can eat. Which you know, basically, I come home. I have a Roku box. Many Blu Ray players support this. PS three does. The Xbox three sixty does. The Nintendo Wii does. So you don't have you know you you know I there's a million ways to get Netflix on your big screen TV or as you do it, Steve, on your iPad. Which is a fantastic way to watch TV. Oh. Makes it a, makes your iPad a personal television. I mean, it's really awesome. Yeah. Um, so these are these are. I'm just scrolling through the net. If you go to Netflix.com/slash/twit, you can take a look at what's available on the Watch Instantly section. I was just watching, and I, I have to say, I want to give this a little plug. This was an HBO series. Um, Oh, I'm now watching this. Hold on. <laughs> I don't want to actually go into the show. Oh, well. Now we're watching Larry Sanders' show. Uh, this is an HBO series that um, came out in the 90s. This is actually a good test to show you how quickly you can load up a movie or a TV show and start watching it. And I've been going through the uh, Larry Sanders' show one by one. There's 89 episodes, and it's just like I'm eating them like candy. I'm watching three or four episodes a night now. Uh, and, you know, I watched this once before, but the fact that you could just watch it is just fantastic. We'll go back to the uh, the browser here, but that's it, how quickly it started up. Yes, something is different about, like, I, I don't know, I, I, I guess I'm just still old school, but it's, it's so, it sort of freaks me out that I can have 
access to all of that content. It's so awesome. Wherever I am at any yeah. time. I mean, I'm a movie person. So if someone's not a movie person, it's like, oh, yeah. On. But Well, TV know. shows too. I mean, they've got oh, yeah, the Mad right. Men's well, coming. All, uh, all four seasons of Mad Men. Uh, they've got Glee on here. Do they have Breaking Bad? Oh, I don't know. I could I could check. That's is a that great show. I don't think the, they do. I think they have. The gal that cuts get... my hair just raves about it, and she she actually made some discs for me, but I never got around. I, I think I watched the first one and it kind of got away from me. So they yeah, don't anyway. have play instantly, but you can get the DVDs. And I am a big fan. Yeah, this is a great show. So there's another example. Netflix is just. Um, I love it. How could you not? So are they Netflix? in the process of digitizing them and bringing more online, or are there copyright restrictions? It's all about they... rights. Okay. So, but they've done a lot of deals with. It's interesting with movie companies to make these and TV companies to make these available. Sometimes, and this is kind of interesting, movies come and go. So there's always new movies on here, and then occasionally movies will leave. There are some sites. I, I I'll find the name. There are sites you can use to follow what's coming and going. So you can, like, it'll tell you there's three days left on this movie, and you can you can watch it. But right. the point that really is, yeah, it's totally contractual. But the point really is just. There's all sorts of stuff on here, and not a night goes by where I. It's instantwatcher.com. Thank you, Dave. A. There's not a night that that goes by that I don't just I don't plan ahead, so you don't have to. There's avoid the hassle not only of the movie store and the red box, but even of just ordering a DVD. It's just I don't have to think about it. There's great stuff here, and there always will be, and uh, more than much more than VOD. And by the way, seven ninety nine a month. But here's your chance to try it free for thirty days. There are very few people like Steve who don't know this already. <laughs> uh, but I will tell you right now, if you are not a member, you should join. And the other thing you might want to do is try to find people in your life who don't know about Netflix. And I'll tell you why. First of all, give them say do the free trial. We benefit from that. But then uh, you can go to your account. Uh, and um, you can buy them gift subscriptions, which is so cool. Gift subscriptions and special offers. So, for instance, I, I buy a year at a time for my mom. And it's really great. I mean, this is a great little gift. Uh, and they'll send them a, a custom email. See, there was the Father's Day tie and everything. Uh, this is just a great gift for somebody. So if you have friends and family who don't know about Netflix... It's great. Just say, hey, did you hear? Netflix.com slash tweet. You can try it free for 30 days. And then monitor their reaction. And if they like it before the 30 days runs out, you just get them the subscription and you will have some happy people. It is my mom. It's like every time she uses it, she thinks of me, which is pretty sweet. So I want you to try it. Get your friends to try it. Netflix.com slash tweet. And we do really appreciate the fact I've been trying to get Netflix on here. I've been a member since 2000. So for 11 years, I've been trying to get them as an advertiser. Before the internet, you were using Before Netflix. there was the internet, I was a Netflix user. Netflix.com slash twit. All right, Steve, we only have time for a couple of questions. So what, let's do a few just to token questions here. Yep, it looks like I sort of scaled that correctly. Yes, you did. <laughs> yes, you did. So it's your turn, Leo. Uh, oh, I read them, don't I? Sure. Doi. All right. <laughs> Let me get my reading glasses on here. <laughs> Question huh. one. <laughs> Question one. John Fecco in Cape Coral, Florida. He asked, asked this on Twitter, so it's nice and short. Does encrypting everything that goes into a database prevent SQL injection attacks? Which I thought was a great question. It is. Yes. And the answer is no, unfortunately. Oh. Um, encrypting everything that goes in does encrypt the database. That is the database's data. But the the SQL injection attacks are 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 typically used at not a, not with the data but with the command the SQL command and so the, the problem is that you the way current web server backends are set up they have an SQL database which is participating in the creation of the page so like you're on a web forum and the the content of the forum is coming from the database and being decrypted as it's being brought out to the user's client but the unfortunately the page itself contains commands sql commands which the 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 server interprets as the page is being generated and rendered and send to the client. So it's it's when bad guys are able to inject some 
commands into a site that they're able to get the the SQL data um, to be did they inject it to be treated as a command, and so even if that was encrypted, when stored, when it's displayed, it's decrypted. So it it ends up being that the, the commands are decrypted, just like the data that's being displayed on the page would be decrypted. And so the encryption on the back end doesn't help you. It helps you if the database file were to get copied somewhere, because then it's just going to be gibberish if someone doesn't have the matching key. But but essentially, the injection attack uses the live data, which necessarily is decrypted in order to become live. So no help there. But great question, John. Patrick, Laramie, Wyoming, comments and wonders about latency versus bandwidth. Steve, while I realize this is outside the normal scope of security now, I feel this topic should be discussed. ISPs typically quote their performance numbers in megabits per second. While this number can be useful, it doesn't tell you anything about the performance of the connection. Just, well, that's interesting. What everyone perceives as a fast internet connection is actually low latency, not high bandwidth. A low latency T1, say over fiber, will feel screaming fast, even though it's only 1.44 megabits per second, compared to a high latency satellite connection, even if the satellite moves data at twice the rate. For all non-saturated networks, latency is the king of the hill, not bandwidth. Although bandwidth does make a difference for high amounts of data being transferred, say, a video, a large image when you're downloading a file, that kind of thing. Yet all ISPs merely quote bandwidth. I'd rather spec a connection based on latency rather than bandwidth. What do you think, Patrick? Well, I think b both are important, but he does raise a very That's good, good point. point. Yes. Yes, because, because the Internet, the way the web experience is is highly transactional we've talked often about how the browser makes a query the server sends the page back the browser parses the page containing a ton of resources which the browser then needs to ask for from all over the net so each of these things oh and sometimes it has to look up a domain name so it's got to send out dns queries but the point is many many little transactions and so if there was a, a, a delay per transaction, many of these are being done in parallel, but many of them have to be done in serial, like the DNS address has to be obtained from the domain name before the, the client can then make a query out to the remote server and so forth. So it's absolutely the case that a high bandwidth, high latency experience for that kind of transactional work will feel very slow. But to your point, Leo, transferring a big file right. won't be a problem because TCP has all kinds of fancy technology now, which actually is, was not as fancy in the beginning. This was added to, t to, to the TCP spec over time as the Internet grew and as the bandwidths increased. The idea is that as we talked long ago, early in the podcast, TCP um, has this notion of a, of a window which allows the sender to send data ahead which hasn't yet been acknowledged by the recipient. And that's necessary, otherwise things would go really slowly. Otherwise, latency would be a huge problem. So this notion of being able to send things a ahead and have delayed acknowledgement, as it's called, is specifically to address the latency problem. And and it's actually, the there is a, a, a bandwidth delay product, is what it's formally called, the bandwidth delay product. It says it's the bandwidth times the delay that you care about, and you want to keep that um, you, you, you want you want to work to optimize the bandwidth delay product. So, great question, Patrick, and a very good point. Yeah, we. I just I won't name names, but I just replaced the. This is another one, and you have a benchmark to uh, test it. The DNS server, a slow DNS server will make you appear Ooh. to have slow surfing because it takes a while to come back with the uh, the uh, domain that you are or uh, IP address, and and that latency uh, can also kill you even if you have very fast connection. Yep. Um, I just replaced on one of my ISPs the domain name server for the ISP with open DNS and boom, big, huge difference. feels like my connection speed has tripled, but it hasn't. Yeah, 
Yeah, and I've had a lot of feedback. You know, again, we did talk about GRC's DNS benchmark, which is a free bit of freeware uh, <laughs> from me, um, which uh, which does exactly that. And a, a lot of people have said, "Hey, I you know I found that in in, in one guy's case, I remember seeing he said 4.2.2.1 is the fastest for him, and that's one of the level three servers that's been around forever." Um, and and frequently fast and um, open DNS is very fast as well. So yeah. it, as you say, test uh, it, that though. can absolutely slow you down. Download Steve's Testa, yeah, uh, and you can find out what the best is because it it would be different everywhere. I, I imagine every every user would have a different experience. Uh, Patrick McCauley in Guelph, Ontario, Canada, asks abandoned passwords. Steve, did you see this Gizmodo piece arguing for abandoning passwords in favor of some entirely new scheme for online identity? He said, read the comments after the piece uh, as well. I, we'll put the link in the show notes. I already have on the uh, show wiki. Um, uh, you could also Google Gizmodo. It's time to abandon passwords. Matt Honan uh, wrote this uh, on Gizmodo. What do you think? Um, well, <laughs> um, every time I use my little always present and never very far away from me football to authenticate to PayPal, I'm glad that they offer it. Yes. Uh, what we clearly need, I, 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 the, the, there was a, a blurb, we, it was a, the Sega Pass comment, the uh, blog posting that I read, where Sega said, None of our users' financial information was lost because we use a third-party provider. Um, that that struck me as, yeah, I mean, that's cool. And if there was one that I absolutely trusted, I would love to offload that responsibility. I mean, you know, I, for, for myself, I wrote all my own code and developed my own um, merchant processing and credit card processing system. Um, just because I know I'm security is paramount for me, and I would hate to ever have to write a letter to my users saying that the people who process, you know, our credit cards have been compromised, and therefore, you know, you might be in trouble. I, I, I would hate that. So, so if you if if there were somebody that you could offload that that responsibility to that would be fantastic similarly we really do need some sort of centralized um, some centralized third party solution you know we've talked about uh, open id as being sort of a you know well sort of a, a quick hack for doing that it's it's sort of limping along and not really taking off there is work by the u.s government put putting together something called, um, I think it's NTSIC, is the, uh, or NSTIC, I can't remember the acronym, but we're, I've got it on my notes to talk about it, because the notion is it's like a trusted infrastructure for authenticating users. What we need is some s single central place or places, I don't care if there's competition, but, but right now the problem is we're doing authentication per site. And that's just wrong. We need to have that centralized. I mean, there's a there's a downside, of course, and that is if it's centralized, then that's the pot of gold that the bad guys go after. But it is, I will say again, not impossible to have security done right. It just has to be really important to the company to do it right and and to care. And so if we had if if we authenticated with a, a single authority and and use multi-factor authentication if you want to i mean for the added security i certainly would then then websites would would use you know would bounce us there to authenticate and just get back an anonymous token that is that says okay the same person who created this account before is back and that's how we would identify ourselves rather than having to give every single place we visit our name and address and information and and so on and so forth so i mean there's it, there's at, we're to the point now where this has to happen it is time for it to happen the idea that we have to individually 
create accounts, and then we're responsible. All of the burden, all the onus is on us not to reuse the same password, not to, you know, you're almost tempted not to reuse the same email address, although that's difficult for, for many users. I, I have, you know, I control my own server, so I have, you know, Netflix at grc.com, for example, or, um, you know, those. I'm able to, to easily create those on an as-needed basis so that I've got separate identities um, all over the place, which is unfortunately not convenient for most people. But uh, yes, we really do need to have this taken care of, Leo. Something has to happen. I'd love to see something. Well, and this is what I use uh, for SSH. I use um, uh, public key cryptography to log. I don't use a password. I use, uh, you know, I use, a, I don't know what you would call it, but I, but uh, it's auto I'm automatically authenticated when I log on to my SSH server because I have the key on my server and it's a known key on that server and I don't know right. what do you call yeah, that? Well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you, you are that. using strong cryptographic security and that I, yeah, I, strong I, cryptographic authentication. Right. So I don't ever enter a password. I just SSH on that computer and because that right. that key is on that. It's yeah. I don't know what you call it, but anyway, it's, it works. <laughs> uh, and I actually asked our admins. I said, "Is this okay?" And they said, "Oh yeah, we, this is preferable. We don't want you to uh, use a password. You just use your SSH key." Right. Uh, and that does that is great. So um, that's how yep, I. Do we're going to get there. We're in the we're in the wild west days still, and the responsibility is ours. Um, I am working on something, uh, which is going to um, be cool. And we'll talk about it in a couple of weeks. Okay. <laughs> I can't wait. Steve it's, Gibson. Uh, it's in this password space. Steve still. Gibson is the man in charge of GRC, the Gibson Research Corporation, GRC.com. If you want to uh, download any of his great stuff, including the fantastic Spinrite, the world's best hard drive maintenance and recovery utility, but also lots of freebies on there uh, for security and encryption and passwords and all that stuff, even just fun, like Wizmo. Uh, you can also follow him on Twitter. His uh, Twitter handle is SGGRC, uh, SGGRC on Twitter. And uh, actually, as we can see now, he responds and follows and does interesting stuff with that Twitter information. So that's good. Uh, thank you, Steve, for being here. We do the show every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, live.twit.tv is the place to go to watch it. Uh, do keep uh, up. I'll post a blog post uh, on the twit.tv site and on my blog about uh, what the Your security hack was, uh, if it, information it was compromised, if any, if anything, uh, you know, the only information we have is some people on our IRC have passwords. That database could have been compromised. If you have an IRC password, uh, it would probably behoove you to change it. And if you have foolishly used that IRC password on other sites, you might want to, might want to change those other sites as well. We don't have any reason to believe that was compromised. That's just prudent. Um, and uh, we'll find out more, and I will post, keep you posted, because I believe in full disclosure. Uh, Steve, thanks, and we'll talk to you next week on Security. Talk to you then, Leo. Bye-bye. Security now.